Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is for the week ending September 18th, 2020. It's videocast episode 48, podcast episode 38. And as we do each week, I want to get started with our media spots and the messages we conveyed. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Ellie Terrett and Liz Clayman for having me on the Clayman Countdown on Tuesday. And the question there was uh, posed to me with uh, with the tech stocks kind of lightening up. Um, would you buy brokers or the toll takers, which was uh, a great question. Um, very simply put, I, I referenced the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey, which came out that morning on Tuesday morning where 80% uh, of managers said that tech was the most crowded trade, uh, which is the highest percent ever in the history of the multi-decade survey. And secondly, that uh, the managers also found that uh, tech bubble was the second largest tail risk of the survey. Now, this is over 200 managers managing actually $600 billion this month. Uh, so the reason that tech got so crowded, and we covered this uh, two weeks ago when we were talking about uh, Apple being overvalued and Wells Fargo being undervalued, the most loved and the most hated stocks, is that when the economic growth outlook is slow growth, meaning shutdowns, cases spike, etc., money chases into tech because it has to bid up those few pockets of the market that can have earnings growth when the economy is growing slowly, and that's basically tech and to a lesser extent healthcare. And that's why you've seen these multiples go crazy. That's why you've seen the snowflakes and you've seen the zooms and you've seen the Teslas and the Fang, etc. And now that we're getting closer to the vaccine and the catalyst, uh, you're seeing the huge rotation into cyclicals. Uh, it started in materially, obviously you're seeing industrials and transports. And why this is happening, number one, it happens every single cycle coming out of a recession. Uh, we've had two quarters of negative earnings growth. It looks like we're going to have a, a huge third quarter. Atlanta Fed GDP now has it at uh, 31% uh, GDP. So um, managers are starting to move. And this collapse in FANG is very, very healthy for the market long term. So um, this rotation is consistent with 2021 earnings growth. Energy is going to have the highest earnings growth, obviously off a very low base of negative earnings. Industrials, 86% earnings growth. Consumer discretionary, 77% earnings growth. Uh, financials, 32% earnings growth. And materials, 29% earnings growth. All greater than the S&P 500, which is going to grow 26%. And tech is only going to grow half of that at 13% uh, 13 and, 13 and change. So a lot of the growth has been pulled forward for tech, and now managers are sniffing that out and saying, wait, we don't have to pay up for a handful of stocks when all of these other sectors are now coming into play and are going to have huge earnings growth in the beginning of a new cycle off of low bases. So it's supply and demand, and there's much more demand of growing stocks now that the economy is in recovery. And um, so the question was, you know, would you buy the risky tech stocks or would you buy, they wanted me to focus on brokerages. I, I you know, I'm not a huge fan of brokerages, but, I, you know, I love financials and, and we're going to talk more about that. So I talked about the major banks, Wells Fargo, obviously, JP Morgan, Bank of America. And then on the brokerage side, I talked about Schwab, but Schwab, you know, with no commissions, they have to make their money on asset management. They have to, on wealth management, uh, financial advisory, etc. cetera. Um, but they do benefit from the same factors that banks benefit from. One of the key uh, income sources is net income margin. And another finding in the survey was that um, managers believed that yields on the long end would go up uh, more so from a credible vaccine announcement than inflation itself, which is mind boggling. So they felt that yields would start to go blow out on the long end uh, once the vaccine was approved. 
number one. Number two, when inflation started to show up, inflation's down the road. So that's another factor that's going to help dramatically the uh, the banks, number one. And, and in this case, the question was about brokerages. So I just chose Schwab. And um, uh, and that's going to be a big, big tailwind with net interest margins. So thank you again to Ellie Terrett and Liz Clayman for having me on Fox Business on Tuesday. On Monday, I was on uh, Cheddar TV with Brad Smith. Always enjoy going on with Brad. Uh, first subject we, we covered uh, was, um, uh, and he always calls me Tommy Two Hands or something. Uh, I, I have to Google that because he... Uh, there's only one other person in my life that called me Tommy uh, uh, all these years, but I, you know, I love it and I love going on with Brad. But the last time I was on with him was September 1st. It was like the day before that Apple hit its top, if not that day um, before the split. It was $535. You divide by four. Um, anyway, um, and I was talking to him about, you know, the current PE was at 39 times at the moment at that time. The highest it had been in the last decade and a half had been 26. It was trading at a 61% premium. I said the inmates were running the asylum and sure enough, it just rolled over. And what we've seen in the last two weeks is this uh, just came out today. Apple has quietly dropped 22% from its peak, giving up $500 billion in market cap. I mean, that was to the day. You can look up the uh, interview with Brad Smith from September 1st. This one was from September 14th. And um, after we got that out of the way, we talked about uh, the catalyst for the move into economically sensitive names. This has been a theme for us for many weeks, longtime listeners, first time callers, maybe we have some on today, uh, but we've been talking about that. And by the way, you can go back and review every single article we've ever done uh, underneath categories, under sentiment uh, and then every podcast under podcast or video cast under video cast and you can see everything we've done and you can see all the interviews either under featured on here or featured on under categories right there so um uh so so we were basically talking about We've got 25 vaccines in phase one, 14 in phase two, nine in phase three, three uh, uh, that have emergency limited use approval and zero that have full approval. We need the full approval. And that was going to be the catalyst for the reopening trade for the economically sensitive stocks outperform in the early cycles. So you can tell I'm pretty consistent in my messaging across platforms. Um, and uh, but I, I specifically emphasized on banks and this was a longer segment so I could go into it. Uh, and I wanted to go into Cecil. The last time I've covered Cecil on TV was CNBC London on June 14th. You guys can you can Google that. That'll come up. Tom Hayes, CNBC London. And effectively, um, the point was that, you know, banks plummeted in Q2. Obviously, the pandemic, people worried about um, uh, loan losses, et cetera. There was an accounting change called CECL, current expected credit loss that went into a place for Q2. And basically what happened was banks reported five, the big four banks reported $5 billion of pre-tax income for Q2 2020 relative to 30 Four billion dollars the same quarter Q2 2019 huge drop it looks like the end of the world tragedy however if you drop the paper change of Cecil because that's all it is it's just taking a hundred percent of expected credit losses all at once up front which is ridiculous but anyway that's the rule it's just like when uh, FASB caused the financial crisis in 2007 with FAS 157 mark to market that actually caused the crisis the basically great depression of 2008 um long story short it's not going to cause any crisis here because we can parse through it uh but if you compare pre-tax of 2020 to 2019 for the top four banks apples to apples uh 2020 even after shutting the world down for three months in q2 they still would have earned $28 billion 
relative to $34 billion. So a $6 billion loss taking out Cecil, um, comparing apples to apples, is much more accurate than what people, what it looked like, which was a $19 billion swing, um, which is just, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, what, what, what would have been a $29 billion swing, which is basically with Cecil, they earned 5 billion versus 34. Without Cecil, they earned 28 billion versus 34. So, um, six versus 29. And what's key about that is that all of those over conservative reserves are going to start coming back on as income, uh, in coming quarters and coming years. And Jamie Dimon actually came out, uh, I guess it was later that day at a conference and said just as much. Jamie, JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon tells analysts reserve releases could come. So he's already talking about that and, uh, which is nice to see because he was one of the most scared, uh, um, outlooks in March and April, and he's now changing his tune saying, wait, maybe we over-reserved, this will come back as income. And we've been saying that, you can go back to our July interview, we've been saying that even longer than that. Uh, and a few good um, uh, reporters over at Barron's were on top of this for, since day one, Al Root and Carlton English. Carlton is my go-to bank reporter. I read everything she writes. You guys got to check that out on Barron's. Um, and she's been putting out, we'll cover uh, a number of things on um, Wells Fargo. So uh, that was kind of the crux of the message with Brad. I want to thank Brad Smith, Francesca Conti for inviting me on, also Jeff Cohen and Amanda Weston, part of the production team. So thank you all for having me on Monday. And then... Um, Ah, the other point that I, that is salient to this is there's a reporter at Bloomberg named Elena Popina, uh, P-O-P-I-N-A. She put this out, and it's one of the key things that I've covered on one of my recent interviews. It might have been with Brad, but you know now that everyone's starting to worry about Fang, when we were talking about it two two three weeks ago before it unraveled, all the Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, um, Google, and Microsoft, et cetera, are all coming down 10 to 20 plus percent in the last, you know, 10 trading sessions. Um, this is not the tech wreck of 2000. However, <clears throat> just to give you peace of mind, if you had been in the right stocks as the NASDAQ collapsed 80, 90 percent from 2000 to 2002, uh, give or take, you know, Amazon was down 90, 95. That's not going to happen this time. But even if it did, which it won't, uh, if you had been in an S&P equal weight index, or now they have equal weight ETFs, which basically says you're more in cyclicals because right now the S&P 500 is excessively overweight tech, which is why you're seeing pressure on the indices as these five or six stocks are really correcting hard. Um, if you had just been in an equal weight ETF over the next 12 months while the NASDAQ was collapsing, Amazon was going down 90%, Qualcomm, all those Cisco's, etc., cetera, um, you would have been up 25% in the same 12 months that the NASDAQ was absolutely collapsing in the worst case scenario in tech's history. We are not going into that worst case scenario, but it points to the importance of sector rotation and what sectors outperform coming out of a recession. Q1 and Q2, negative GDP. Q3 is going to be plus 31%. We are in a new cycle. What performs best? Cyclicals, industrials. We like, okay, so industrials have moved huge. Transports have, have moved huge. What do we like now? We like the laggards that are left uh, where we can still find value. We like banks in a big way. Um, uh, we like pockets of energy. We like defense stocks. Okay. If you think the rhetoric is going to cool down with China, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's going to continue. I think phase one is going well. The purchases are being made. We'll probably be fine. You know, with this TikTok stuff and, and WeChat, et cetera, it's going to go back and forth. 
and it's going to bring attention to the low valuation relative valuation of um, of defense stocks and I think there's an enormous opportunity there as well home builders we've been on since March and April they've had a monster runs they're going to go more but I mean you know uh, I hold things that are up 100% I don't buy things that are up 100% so um, uh, so so that is that but basically what she's saying uh, Elena E-L-E-N-A P-O-P-I-N-A. I'm, I'm spelling it out so you can search her on Twitter if you want to follow her stuff. Um, she's saying size matters. <laughs> Equal weighted, S at least she has a sense of humor. Equal weighted S&P 500 outperforms its cap weighted peer by the most since 2009. So guess what 2009 was? The beginning of a brand new cycle. <laughs> so we are in the exact same situation. Uh, I think a good analogy is like summertime 2009 after you had a big bounce off the lows. Everyone was waiting for, you know, okay, we've had this huge run. We're, we're in a bubble. No, we're at the beginning of a new cycle where you get these 10% corrections to shake out the weak sisters that got in too late, that didn't believe it in March and April when we were pounding the table, that just jumped on in, in, in August by buying some ridiculous, you know, thing like who knows what, what they were buying. Um, but, uh, this is an amazing opportunity to buy those things that have just started getting going and uh and we're going to talk about some of them today and you can tell i'm excited about that uh next i want to thank devic jane and surashi Sar, uh surashi sanyal for including me in their article on reuters today basically you know tech was up um this morning because there was a report about cases spiking in Europe and uh, basically I said to him you know when this is a chronic back and forth when it looks like we're gonna have shutdowns or cases tech gets a bid and cyclicals go to sleep and when it looks like we're gonna get a positive announcement on a treatment or a um, or cases come down or vaccine makes a, a milestone or, or development cyclicals go up and tech goes down the net message of the last three weeks is not that the world is collapsing the net message of the last two weeks is people are getting the hell out of tech because we're starting a brand new cycle and they want to be in those cyclical stocks that are going to make the most money on a relative basis in the shortest period of time now granted cyclicals may only perform the first you know three outperform the first three four quarters of a brand new cycle but you can make you can mint money during that period in these groups that have has been unloved and now we're going to get some love okay so uh the message i sent to uh devic when he called me was that the market's in a vacuum right now anytime um and i said you know the same thing anytime you have news or perception that things are going to be delayed you have a slow growth economy those technology stocks get bid you get these technical bounce days when coronavirus cases spike up and money will move back to tech. So, and, and the reverse is true. Now, the things that I told Devic to be looking for are, uh, what is the vacuum? The vacuum is market is just kind of flailing around waiting for information. It's waiting for information on one, the vaccine, two, the election, three, Earnings, earnings are going to start up again in earnest in just a couple of weeks. Uh, and four, to a lesser extent, expectations are now very low, a stimulus package. I got to say, uh, they'll do a continuing resolution. You know, the stimulus of package affects those people who are most in need. Um, and they tend to be concentrated. Um, well, you know, they're, they're, they're all over, okay? But I would not want to go back to my constituency running for Senate or running for Congress um, and and, you know, look all all these people in the face and say we couldn't get it done like a, a final stimulus check. You know, and, and the other thing is, like, if I hear the word bailout from anyone, I'm, I'm going to really get disappointed. You know, this is 
it, it's not a bailout when the government mandates you close your business for three months and you cannot do business even if you want to do business. That's not a bailout. That's a confiscation of your livelihood and you deserve compensation for it. There's no two ways about it. And, uh, you know, there was um, a Fed figure, not the chair, thank God, out today talking about banks getting bailed out. That's, you know, that is not the kind of rhetoric that is useful when the world gets shut down for three months because of a once in a hundred year black swan. That stuff is going to happen and we have the mechanisms to deal with it and we, we have dealt with it so effectively I, like chair powell started out as one of the shakiest uh fed fed governors and yeah you know uh fed chairs of all time like i was like what is this guy doing he's going to go down in history as one of the best he saved us as from a great depression along with secretary mnuchin along with larry kudlow along with the administration they acted so swift and so forcefully and so massively i mean we're at uh 8.4 percent unemployment you know, they were predicting 30 and 40 percent at the bottom in March and, and April. And now they were out today saying they're going to be at six and a half by the end of this year. That's crazy. I mean, in a good way, but that's crazy. So uh, the point I'm making about the stimulus is maybe we'll, the market now has like zero expectations for, for anything getting done. Uh, we might actually get something because. I can't see these people going home and saying vote for me when I got nothing done for you and I've been completely useless for the last two months in the time in history when you've needed me most I didn't come through vote for me that's a terrible campaign slogan so um, we may get this uh, you know white swan that no one's expecting you get a trillion trillion and a half package second checks extended unemployment till December um, you know I'm not betting the ranch on it by any stretch as a matter of fact it's not even in my base case but I just think like human nature about survival, C Congress people are no different. They just want to get reelected. That's what they live for. And to go home with nothing in their hand, uh, yeah, you know, r risky, career risk. Uh, and, uh, and people don't like that. So it's the same thing that managers that have been overweight tech now have career risk uh, going into year end. So they got to panic into cyclicals now that they panicked out of tech. Okay. Moving along, um, some thematic uh, notes that came up with um, some th thematic notes that came up with uh, with that cyclical theme. Bank of America put out a research report uh, today about uh, energy and financials may have the biggest potential upside top buys for 2021. They've been listening to our podcast. <laughs> We've been talking about this for the last few weeks. Uh, so they named a few stocks, Apache, Citigroup. Uh, yeah, I like Citi. I, I, they're, they're all fine. I mean, they're all going to work. Hess is going to work. Uh, Pioneer National Resource. It, it's all going to work. As long as you're high enough up the food chain, SVB Financial, it's a regional bank, that'll work. So kudos to Bank of America Securities for putting out that research note today. And, you know, I give them credit because... Um, they're not late. They're, they're right on time. And, um, that was good to see. We're seeing a ton, like, I've never seen so much call premium one and two years out for Exxon Mobil, particularly yesterday. It was just huge. 10,000 blocks like crazy. I highlighted one 13,000 contract block. Uh, we like Exxon here. I think this is a huge opportunity. Uh, the fear is they're going to cut the dividend. I hope they do. That would be bullish, you know, sell the rumor, buy the news. I don't think they will, but um, um, I, I, I think it's interesting. So that that's in line. OPEC basically did the draggy. They said uh, we're going to crush the um, – ah, here, here we go. OPEC urges full conformity with production cuts, and Saudi Arabia's energy manager, minister warns market gamblers will be hurt like hell. Uh, basically, they're saying, uh, don't bet against oil. We are going to control this market. And we talked about this in June. We put out the Rystead thing where we said we would be going from a surplus to a draw. We've drawn pretty much every single week. This week, we had a monster draw. Oil was up like 11% off the bottom in two days. Um, 9 million barrels, I think we drew. We'll cover that later in, in the thing. The cuts have persisted. 
oil will get a bid and then we're going to have a monster shortage because there's been no major investment for five years uh you'll see it you just have to be patient you know uh, if you need to make money in the next week i'm not the person that you want to tune into if you need to you know if you're looking for ideas that are going to work huge materially over time uh you know and and, and many of you've been with me now since episode one and two and you've continued to come back every week i know i see the numbers keep growing um you you know how it plays out and uh and these are the type of ideas that we really really press on so um so that's that now i um randomly pulled up this chart to just this afternoon this is a weekly chart of wells fargo because you know we've gone through the fundamental case ad infinitum for the last you know four weeks about uh book value about earnings power about 10 billion of cuts about um you know seven billion dollars of savings per year on the um on the uh, dividend cut so that's 17 billion a year right there about new management about hopefully cat a catalyst of uh releasing the um uh, asset cap of 1.95 trillion they had a cap put put on them by the regulators for the sales practices two years ago the problem is no one's left in management that was part of the bad practices they've reformed completely so there's no reason to keep the asset cap on particularly when the government wants a recovery sustainable recovery you can't choke off one of the biggest lenders in the country and expect a sustainable recovery so let the cap off of wells fargo and let the economy fly and let them lend like crazy leaving that said i think the market i think this stock is finally sniffing out i mean Watching it daily, because we built a, a, a really nice size position in this uh, um, since the crash. And like, you know, you look at it here and it's, you know, we've got a basis, uh, you know, uh, now we're just at about the basis here. But um, it's, you know, this is a weekly chart. So daily, it's like literally like, you know, Chinese water torture every day. It's like up a penny, down a penny, up a penny, down a penny, up 10 cents, down 10 cents, up 50 cents. Oh, we're going to get, you know, up, down 20 cents, you know. But if you step back and zoom out, um, since we've gone through the fundamentals like crazy, it's trading at a 38% discount to book. It's only done that two times in its history, 1992 and 2009. In both instances, it recovered to book value within months, not within years, which means that, uh, you know, we're looking at about $40 uh, a share book value. It, it, historically, it will exceed that on its run up. Um, so um, so I, I pulled up technicals and, and I don't spend a lot of time on this type of analysis, but it is kind of useful because if you look at this on the left is volume by price. This is where the majority of the stock was purchased uh, historically. And it's interesting because it correlates specifically with where it did a quote unquote breakout in 2013. So it was consolidating for a handful of years. It broke out in 2013 and went from 25 to 50. So it basically doubled. And now it's gone back to retest the breakout at 25. And that's where all the purchasing volume is. So that's where there's a lot of institutions defending the price in theory. I mean, this stuff, you take it with a grain of salt, you know, but it's worth you looking at. What I'm more interested in with any of these indicators, and I threw one up that I rarely ever use, uh, but it really was interesting. It's called the ADX Average Directional Movement Index. And just Google it. It was uh, developed in 1978 by Wells Wilder. And I, I don't want to get into the whole formula of it because you can Google that, number one. And number two, the formula doesn't matter. What matters is does it work or doesn't it work? And the way you measure that is you put it, um, you see if it did what it was supposed to do when the index triggered historically. And if it's, you know, greater than 80, 90 percent, it's something that you should probably look at from time to time because it's a useful thing to look at. If it's 50, 60 percent, just get a just get a coin with heads or tails and, you know, flip around and write a book about it. But um, this one is pretty useful on a weekly basis uh, in the case of Wells Fargo. So, number one, we've got huge support here at the twenty five dollar level, which it seems to be holding. The stock is up 3.54% this week, which is pretty good considering, um, you know, the most loved stock is getting slaughtered. Apple, the most hated stock, Wells Fargo, is up 3.5%. This, we're seeing 
the signs of the rotation we've been pounding the table about. So <clears throat> what we're looking at in this ADX symbol is when the green ADX line crossed the red ADX line, meaning you were going from a negative trend to a positive trend. It just crossed this week with the stock up 3.4%, uh, three, I'm sorry, 3.54%. And uh, what's happened the other times that it did? So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 instances since 2008 where you had that cross. In 15 of those instances, 15 out of 16, you had an immediate rally in the stock. Um, so here we are, rally, here we are, we got a little rally here, here we are, that was about, uh, looks like about 10%. Uh, here we are from 43 to 58. Here we are again from 38 to 51. Uh, and this was the only failure in August of 2016. So it fell off a few points, but then it rallied right after. So it wasn't a complete failure, but you know, a lot of people would have gotten shaken out here. So we'll just call that a failure. Uh, here it went up after the cross, up after the cross, up after the cross. And this is after a huge long uptrend. Uh, here began a multi-year rally from 24 to 48. Uh, here, uh, you got a, a nice bounce from 22 to 27, 28 in there. Uh, same thing here. You got to move from 17 to 26. So these are monster moves. I mean, 30, 40, 50% moves. Uh, again, worked, worked. And then uh, in the big... 2009, remember, only happened two times where it traded at this discount to book. It historically trades between 1 to 1.75 times book. It traded at 1.75 book times book as recently as uh, a couple years ago. It's now trading at uh, you know 0.62 times book. It traded lower than that, 66% uh, discount in 2009. Within a month, it was back up to book. Book value now is about $40 a share and maybe a little bit more. Uh, looking forward. So it's it's just interesting to see that, you know, 15 out of the last 16 times that this uh, green ADX line crossed the red, you got a you got a big rally and coupled with it trading at the big discount like 92 and 2009 and the reserves coming back and the cuts and the new management and possibly an asset cap lifted and possibly there was something out today that the um, Federal Reserve is going to uh, release the results of stress test two at the end of the year, but they're going to um, decide by the end of September if it would continue capping bank dividend pay payments and laid out two hypothetical severe recessions it will use to test further bank resilience amid the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus pandemic. So if they allow them to pay dividends, that's That'll just say, okay, we believe the banks are good, even if we got to wait three months for the, you know, comprehensive results. But the scenarios have unemployment spike to 12.5 at the end of 2021, or unemployment jumping to 11% by the end of 2021. We're going in the other direction. We've gone, we've gone from 14, 15% down to 8.4, and now they're projecting 6%, 6.5% by the end of this year. If they're going to tell them they can't pay dividends because in case unemployment doubles by the end of next year after we have a vaccine, they're out of their mind. So I think we're going to get some good news in the next couple of weeks, as, finally, from the regulators. Hopefully, they'll lift the asset cap on uh, Wells Fargo in short order if they want this recovery to be sustainable uh, and let them lend because you need credit growth to have a sustainable recovery. And this thing could absolutely rip. I mean, you know, when these things rip, they just turn. I mean, look what happened in 2009. You know, the thing was up 100 and it went from 5 to 20 in like three weeks. Um, you know, when they turn, you know, here in 2010, you know, went from basically 50%, more than 50% move in a matter of a month and a half. So, um so anyway, there's a technical trigger. Take that for what it's worth. Uh, on the flip side, so there's the support at 25. Where's the resistance? A lot of the, the second place where people were buying, which means they're, you know, 
the theory is they'd have an inclination to sell once they get back to even. So you'd have a lot of so you have a lot of support at 25 and people defending that price, but you might have some selling or resistance at around 45, right in the sweet spot of where there was huge buying historically. Um, and uh, and that's right in line with you know a, a a quick rebound up to book between 40, 45, and 45, you get some sellers that you know got back to even, said foo, and threw in the towel. You know, these things are worth looking at. I, I just th thought you'd find that helpful. Um, Carlton English put out an article on the 14th. I guess that was Tuesday. Another day, another analyst upgrade for Wells Fargo. That's the third in about a week and a half. Uh, we covered Jamie Diamonds. Ah, the trend persists from that interview I had with Brad Smith on September 1st when I was talking about most loved, most hated rotation into cyclicals. Well, it's... Uh, since then, the relative performance of Wells Fargo to Apple continues to just fly. The good news, the good news is, uh, you know, we were right about Apple to the day. Uh, the, the bad news is the ratio has um, catapulted less from the appreciation of Wells Fargo and more from the depreciation of Apple. I'd be just as happy if Apple stayed flat and, uh, and Wells Fargo doubled. But we'll take what we can get. The theme is playing out. And I think I think Wells is going to play catch up soon. Um, okay, we covered that the bank, we covered Apple. Okay, now today, um, Jessica Menton of USA Today put out this article where she quotes Ryan Dietrich of senior market strategist at LPL Financial. He puts out a lot of good charts from time to time, <coughs> and um, they're basically saying that. He says, the recent strength we've seen in stocks signals that Wall Street is siding more with Trump winning re-election, says Ryan Dietrich, senior market analyst strategist at LPL Financial. He's not saying that because he's a Republican or because he's a Democrat. I don't know what he is. He's saying that because 20 of the last 23 elections, the incumbent party has been re-elected when the S&P was positive in the three months before the election, which we are. So those are your odds, 20 of 23 times. It's not the only factor you should consider. Um, and the other point that was made that I thought was interesting, which we've covered in detail, but this is more up to date. We've covered with data back to 1934 and 1928. He's doing it from 1950 to 2019. But he's basically saying if you get a Democratic president, um, you you really want a Republican Congress because you'll get the highest returns that way, 18.3% average. Uh, if you get a Republican president, you really want a split Congress uh, because you'll get the highest returns that way of 17.9%. So you can see right here, uh, the worst scenario is a Republican president with a fully Democratic Congress uh, or a Democratic president with a fully Democratic Congress. I mean, historically, you just don't want sweeps. That That's really what it comes down to. Um, but this goes into a little bit more granularity uh, with the Democratic president, Republican Congress, with the Republican president, split Congress. Historically, that's worked best since 1950. Our stats are a little different if you go back to 1928 or 1934, but a lot of people like to use post-World War II because the market... Uh, mechanism changed a little bit. So Jessica Menton, great article. Uh, New York Times, this is something we talked about all summer, no one was paying attention to, put out an article about Kanye West, quote unquote, perplexing run as a potential 2020 spoiler. So now they're seeing the reality. Now he's on enough ballots in enough close states that he could swing the election and they're paying attention to that. Don't underestimate him. Uh, you know, he became a billionaire selling sneakers because people like him, not because he, you know, maybe he has the best sneakers, but, you know, he's cool. People like him. There's a demographic that's going to go out and vote for him. This is now real. It's in the New York Times. It's not just some idea from a guy on a podcast two months ago when I was telling you guys, pay attention to this, pay attention to this, pay attention to this. And uh, these journalists have stepped up and, and, uh, and picked up on it. All right. Now to the article of the week. The Scott McCreary in between stock market and sentiment results. We write this on Wednesday night. We put it out on Thursday morning after we get the sentiment results. Um, the lyrics in his song, 
speak to the recent change that we're seeing, sectors like tech gr uh, growth and healthcare taking a breather, other sectors like financials and industrials, value and cyclicals catch a bid and pick up the slack. Ain't, who, ain't too high, ain't too low, just holding down the middle, I'm as steady as I go. And that's why you can see stocks like Wells Fargo up 3.5% this week while everything, all the overcrowded tech, stat, SAS, FANG, uh, getting sm uh, smushed. Um, okay, so we covered the interviews, we can skip through that. The other interesting thing that uh, we covered, Cecil, which is critical to understand review that here in the article if uh or or in the podcast we we went over it from uh, brad smith's interview <clears throat> the other point that's important from the fund manager survey results where they said that the announcement of a vaccine would be the most likely thing for yields to go up um everyone's focused on short rates you know when you have the fed come out this week and say we're going to keep rates low for till 2023 you know, they, they have no idea. But what you do know is that they're going to keep rates low, not just to get inflation, they're going to keep rates low to get full employment. That's Powell's passion. If you've watched his conferences, the guy is, a, is really concerned about structural unemployment. He saw the people that got left behind from the last recovery start to get employed in January, February, when we had the, you know, historic unemployment levels at 3.5% was the lowest since post-World War II, like early 50s, 1950s. Um, so those people were starting to win and then you get this black swan called COVID and then they get left behind. So he's gonna keep the pedal on the metal short rates low until end $120 billion of asset purchases a month, 80 in treasuries, 40 in mortgage-backed securities until he can get that unemployment, I, my guess is back under five consistently and get everyone back to work. So everyone's focused on the short end, but they're missing the spread. That's where the banks, the brokerages make all their money, net interest, not all their money. They make a lot of fee money now and banking money, et cetera, but they make a lot of money. The difference between what they pay for capital and what they charge for capital. So we're not concerned with the absolute rates. We're interested in the spread and the spread is now 5x the two year the 10 year yield to the two year yield and that's what you see at the beginning of every recovery after a crash 2009 2003 and then financials this green line rips to the upside rips to the upside and we're back at these levels we've spiked up off the lows this is when it was flat the twos and tens was flat in 2019 and then it inverted now it's 5x the yield curve is steepening even though no one is talking about it and that's why banks are going to rip uh in my humble opinion do your own homework i don't know what your financial situation is read terms terms are up here blah 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 but um that's that uh no pain no gain we just did charts these charts have gotten even more ugly today apple amazon facebook google microsoft netflix no one would have was talking about this two weeks ago when we were pounding the table. There it is. Um, okay, now on to the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey. One of my favorite pieces of data it comes out once a month. Came out Tuesday morning. 224 managers interviewed. 600 billion of AUM. And key findings. Uh, there's still some skepticism, which is good. That gives us a wall of worry to, to climb. 29% <laughs> of respondents still believe it's a bear market rally. That's that's mind boggling to me. It, that just means they missed it. They're wrong. They've got career risk and they're really got problems. Um, it's one thing to be wrong. It's it's another thing to stay wrong. And that's when you, you know, find, you know, that that can be a problem. 61% uh, expect the U or W. Uh, only 20% say V-shaped recovery. What data are they reading? I mean, we're going to go through the economic data today, but you know, just looking at the economic surprise index, um, we're at all time highs. The the amount of data points that we're beating on on a consistent basis relative to expectations is just staggering. So that's V. We got the and V is always equaled vaccine. That looks to be relatively imminent. You know, today they were out saying 100 million people have it by April. So that means, you know, however many could have it by the end of the year, 
tens of millions or, or who knows. Uh, but as long as we get the approval, you know, people are going about their business. We see it. By the way, just to see the most important thing I think this week was not the Atlanta GDP now having uh, Q3 at 31%, 31.7%. I think the most important thing was seeing the Fed take their 2020 GDP estimates from negative 5.5 to negative 3.7. We shut the world down for three months and we're only going to lose 3.7% of production. That is just mind boggling and exciting to see. Um, uh, and, and, and if they're anywhere close to getting unemployment to 6.5% by the end of the year, I mean, with the amount of stimulus that's in the system already, money supply increased, uh, 25% since March, you know, we're going to see six plus percent GDP in 2021. So the best is yet to come. Be nice if Congress walk up and said, you know, there are people that, uh, aren't on Wall Street that actually need some money right now because you just shut down the companies they work for for two or three months and the companies couldn't survive. And then you didn't give them a second PPP to keep these people on the payroll. So give them some money already before you go home to go campaign. Worry about your constituents jobs and you'll guarantee your own job and get it done. Anyway. All right. That's my tangent. Next. Uh, <laughs> all right. So the other finding out of this is that, uh, well, they picked up cash. They got scared about this, this sell-off. Uh, this survey was from September 3rd to the 10th, I believe. Uh, so cash went up to 4.8. Greater than 5% is fear. Less than 4% is greed. So they're closer to fear than they are greed. That's helpful for the wall of worry thesis. Um, we covered 80% believe long U.S. tech is the most crowded trade of all time. Up, uh, that's the highest in the multi-decade history. And uh, the survey shows that they were switching into cyclicals and out of tech. Um, tech, healthcare, and large cap long got trimmed. Industrials are now at the highest overweight since January of 2018. And flows to small caps and value were up as well. That's critical. So they're moving into those unloved laggard sectors. Speaking of which, one of the questions for the Ask Me Anything this week, and I'll cover them now actually, is from Ben. He said, um, uh, 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 here we go. Uh, you said in your podcast that Apple and tech in general have more downside to work out. Uh, yeah. And by the way, that was a risky call last week because everyone, you know, saw that little bounce and they're like, oh, it's, it's done. Da -da -da. And no, I, th I think there's more to work out for, for those over love stocks. I, I, the pain trade is lower because everyone was buying that dip and they just have more to work out. And that's that's a healthy thing. That money's going to go into cyclicals, and it's going to broaden out and create the the power for the next leg leg higher. Um, you know, a, a, after a number of weeks or, or months here. So, uh, and as we get some resolution on vaccine earnings, election, and stimulus, that those things will all help. <laughs> so that proved to be true. I think that persists for a little bit more time on on particularly just those concentrated tech stocks. And what about the Russell 2000? Aren't their PE ratios very extended as well? Um, the PE ratios in a trough of a cycle are always extremely high because earnings are zero or barely positive. So like if you earn one penny and you know, you're know you could be trading at a thousand times earnings because your earnings are very low. So no, small cap is where money is rotating into Concentrated tech is where money is rotating out of. They had their run. Small caps are setting up in time in coming months to have their run. Um, good question, though. And, and we saw that. So small caps, value, cyclicals, industrials, money moving in. That includes, we'll see, banks and energy will be the last of that group. That's why we've already benefited from, from the first phase. Now we want to benefit from the second phase. What's left over? Defense stocks, banks, and pockets of energy start with the highest, 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 highest quality on energy because 25% are still going to go bankrupt, but the 75% remain will mint money. We will have a cycle. We will have inflation. We will see oil at $70. It's just a question of when. Um, but if you need to make money next week, none of these ideas are for you. But if you have a you know nice 12 to 24 to 36 month outlook, I think there's just unprecedented opportunity here. And it may be Set your mind up for three years, but it may be much, much quicker. Um, 
Okay, so those are good questions from Ben. And then can you tell us what indicators you look at regarding monthly op options expiration? I don't do any of that nonsense. That That's like um, day trading. That's a different podcast. I'm sure there are people that are very successful doing that. Find those people. I'll talk about some general indicators. I look at it short term when there's a lot of fear in the market. We'll go through like seven or eight of those. We, we went through five last week. Uh, we'll cover a few more this week that, that can be helpful. But um, uh, no, you got to know what you own, you know, otherwise you're just going to get crushed. I mean, that that's just over time in the short term, you make money, but you, you got to know what you're doing. You got to know what you own and you got to know how these cycles work over time and rotations work and where money's going. Now, it's pretty easy because, as, as I said on Liz Clayman's thing, when I was talking about this theme, is that all you have to do is look at 2021 earnings estimates. It tells you the same story. Indust energy, industrials, consumer discretionary, financials, and materials are all going to grow at faster paces than the S&P next year. Um, earnings growth, because they're coming off a low basis, which is what happens at the beginning of a new cycle. Tech is going to grow at half the pace of the S&P 500. So why would you pay double a multiple? It makes zero sense. And, the, and managers are figuring this out. And the problem is, is that there's only one doorway. Someone just yelled fire in the theater and they're all trying to get out at once. It'll be fine. It's, there's not, it's not going to be some huge dislocation. This is normal. It's just a healthy rotation, a broadening of the rally, setting the stage for the, for, um, you know, the second leg of the beginning of a new, new long-term cycle. Okay, um, ba, ba, ba. we went through GDP now. As far as short-term sentiment, uh, this week it moved up a bit, 32% bullish. That's mid-range. That means neither buy nor sell. It's not an extreme. Same thing with fear and greed at 56. Uh, managers got flushed out with this tech sell-off. They went from 106% equity exposure down to 53. So a lot. sometimes you see bounces here. I think you're going to see the bounces in the sectors that we're talking about, and I think you're going to see more pain in the ones that we've been uh, telling you to avoid for the last handful of weeks. So um, the message for the week was don't bet against science, nine vaccines in phase three. Um, the pain trade is still down for some of the overall names. This I wrote this on Wednesday, and we've now seen it in the last two days. Um, I do not think we're in for a major wholesale correction. There's enough money that has yet to broaden their exposure and get positioned for the reopening trade move into cyclical value. These economically sensitive names outperform in the early high economic growth stages of a new cycle, which we started in Q3. We'll take advantage on any weakness as opportunity abounds in coming months. So that's that. Um, this is just the article. This is August 27th when we were laughing, when we were pitching uh, Wells Fargo, the most hated stock versus the most loved stock. That was a more fundamentally based article. So look that up, the Stevie Wonder Faith Stock Market and Sentiment Results. You can either click here under Sentiment, it'll come up, or just type in the box Stevie Wonder, the search box here, and that'll come up. But we did uh, we did um, the pigs flying because pretty much every day this week, Wells Fargo has been outperforming Apple. And uh, and the joke is when pigs fly, well, pigs are flying. Uh, the Global Fund Manager Sentiment Survey results, we covered most of the key points. There's some charts here you'll definitely want to review. So check that out. Just uh, Google September Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey Results Summary, or you can click on Commentary and find it there commentary is oh and it's actually one of the most it's the second most popular post of the week so you can just go under popular posts and see all the data and see that you know value is outperforming growth in terms of flows where money's flowing and most crowded trade contrarian trades and see all the, the charts australia's unemployment rate falls unexpectedly this is what i've been pounding the table on people are like why do you talk about china all the time i talk about china because it foreshadows what we're going to see. They're at 86% uh, seats in the air in August, domestic air. They'll be at 100% pre-pandemic levels in September. We're two months behind them. So we could be at, you know, we got up to 40%. Uh, we could be at 60, 70%. I just booked a trip to Florida in December. I'll be part of that. 60, 70, maybe 75% of the vaccines announced. People won't have it, but they'll feel better like there's a cure. Um, bottom line is it's safe. They have the HEPA filters, people wear masks, it's totally cool, in my view. 
Um, I've done it. So, uh, and, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are doing it every single day. But the, the thing that's important about Australia's unemployment, because it tells the real story about China. Everyone's always skeptical about China numbers. They're never skeptical when they're bad numbers. They're only skeptical when they're good numbers. But no one was saying, oh, you believe their numbers in January when they were through the floor. Now that the numbers are great, um, they're, they're, they're like, oh, you sure you believe those numbers? Well, look at Australia's unemployment. That tells you everything you need to know about China's economy. Their unemployment rate fell to 6.8 from 7.5%. They added 111,000 jobs. That tells you how China is doing A-OK. -okay. okay, seasonality. Here's something for Ben with his AMA. Selling Rosh Hashanah, buying Yom Kippur. This is an old adage. He just goes through the data since 1971. It's a seasonally weak period next year. But, you know, 2020 is kind of opposite year. So I wouldn't really put much weight in this. Um, leaving that aside, it is what it is. Uh, some indicators. Maybe we can couple, cover a few. If you're on the podcast and you get cut off, just go to hedgefundtips.com and uh, you can watch the video cast the YouTube video just fast forward to the 60 minute point so you don't have to listen again and you can catch the last five or ten minutes I'll try and finish up uh, these are a couple ones PMO buy all I covered that uh, you can google what that is but you know we're getting close to a bounce on the S&P 500 it's just sometimes it, it takes some time for it to bottom sometimes it bottoms right away but we, you know we're closer to a low than we are to a high that's for damn sure you can see it down here at the zero level Sometimes you get these quick bounces, quick bounces. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. It, none of these are foolproof, but they're, they're just kind of barometers. They're not uh, scalpels. So that's that one. Uh, what else? Is skew we covered last week. Bullish percent S&P. These are the percentage of stocks on a point and figure buy signal, I think. Uh, you know, usually bounces are kind of... After these dislocations, I don't think we're going to have another dislocation. It usually bounces in this 45 to 50 range. We're at about 60. You know, maybe it's maybe it's already bounced. Maybe it has a little bit more to go to work off. But again, pick stocks, pick sectors. Let's take a look at any other thing. Uh, bonds to stocks ratio. Uh, so this just looks like a normal consolidation where uh, uh, bonds outperform stocks. You know, that makes sense with the tech sell-off. Um, what else do we look at? Um, this is the 10 day equity put call. Look, this has gone up quite a bit. We're not going to have like a dislocation like this. I, I, I don't think I, you rarely get them back to back. It's usually aftershocks. We already had the earthquake. So, you know, maybe this has a little bit more to go on the 10 day put to call put call ratio. Um, but you see, you know, you get these little spikes and then it comes back in, spikes and comes back in. So, you know, it's not, an, again, a lot of these things are mid-range. They're not an extreme. So you could see a little bit more, particularly in those areas. But other ones like the PMO by all, let's take a look at the PMO by SPX. So you have this bounce. Maybe it goes back down and, you know, does a little more pain or maybe it's done. But, you know, here it was done and you had this fake back. And, you know, you had a lot of choppiness here before it took the next level um again mid-range so that's that's why we're saying pick stocks pick sectors don't um you know don't just wholesale buy or wholesale sell i don't think that's the way you're going to make money in the next few weeks uh as we work out some of these uncertainties so uh so by the way sell rosh Hashanah, that's tonight uh buy yom kippur that is uh monday september 28th so we'll see if that holds this year, but it's just uh, those are the statistics. It's a negative 5% week on average since 1971. We had a few weak weeks coming into it. So my guess is this is probably less valuable than in normal years. Uh, okay, earnings. We did a bunch of earnings. NASDAQ top 30 weights were up 9.5% 2020, revised up in the last 60 days. Biotech were revised up 11.2% in the last 60 days. Materials were revised up 4.4% in the last 60 days. Small caps were revised up 90% in the last 60 days and 32% for 2021 in the past two months, top 30 weights of the Russell. And uh, growth stocks, IBD top 50 were revised up 22% and for 2021 up 12.96. Um, economic surprise index, you see it's come off a little bit, but still at record highs. 
and economic data we've covered quite a bit. Um, we had big draw in oil. We, continuing jobless claims came down. New claims were a little bit higher than we would have liked, but generally in line with expectations. Um, crude inventories, we had the uh, big drop, big draw rather, of 4.3 million barrels. I stand corrected. Oh, it was the API that was the 9, 9 million barrel draw. Uh, four on the um, 4.3 on the uh, the uh, the Wednesday report, and then uh, China retail sales, by the way, grew. That's that's good for everyone. They grew a half a percent, crushed expectations. Industrial production uh, beat expectations, and any other U.S. stuff. Ah, New York Empire State Manufacturing crushed. Was expecting 6.0, got 17.0, up from 3.7. Huge, huge number for New York Empire State Manufacturing. Um, capacity utilization rate continues to go up. That's a good thing. And I think that's basically everything we wanted to cover. Uh, building permits were solid, down a little bit. That, I, I think that's in part due to seasonality and lumber prices were high, but they're coming down now, so I think that's going to go back up. Housing starts were up another 1.4 million. Still a great number. Little little bit of softness, and that's probably in line with the uh, jobless claim because of the uh, Sun Belt shutdowns and all the housing growth is in those areas. So there's probably a little bit of trepidation last month, and that'll come back um, now that uh, that their cases have come down and move, things will go. Consumer expectations, consumer sentiment blew the doors off. This is really nice to see this finally coming back. You know, 70% of the economy is the consumer, 78.9 relative to 74.1 last print on sentiment, on expectation 73.3 relative to 68. So the consumer's coming back and they're rebuilding that confidence that, uh, that got hurt in March and April. It's now coming back. So look, I talked fast. We covered a ton of stuff. Uh, had a great time. Thank you for listening in. We're going to be back next week, same time, same place. Have a great weekend and thanks for listening in.